I don't think Sainz is particularly regretting it. It's Ferrari. They will bounce back at some point. They won't be sixth in the constructors every single year. If you want the Red Bull name back at the top of F1, then you actually need to do something about it. Yeah, I think a lot of people were saying, you know, Zach Brown out at that point. Hello everybody, welcome back to the WTF1 podcast. It's the final, the final episode of 2020. We're here and we have to talk about what happened in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix which is also tear worthy but either way we'll talk about it all the same and we won't just say it's boring for a whole hour most of the time whenever we have a, a boring race it's the the podcasts are longer and the exciting races are shorter so let's see if this is a three-hour podcast joining me in the virtual podcast world is tom bellingham sixty thousand twitter followers you can see his ego from here tommy how are you doing just making sure my head actually fits on the the screen because yeah i'm, I'm surprised so, you got into so into a little podcast booth today yeah. and katie you don't have sixty thousand twitter followers yet but i'm sure with the the level of content much better than tommy's uh, how are you yeah i'm really good thank you yeah it were interesting race weekend but we'll talk about that in a little while we will indeed uh let's get into some three-word race reviews shall we for the 2020 abu dhabi grand prix alex Melizes. I fell asleep. Olivia Hoffman underscore. Quali was better. Julia Van Rossum. Max Simply Lovely. And Julio Braga 2028. Delete this track. Not even modify. Just straight up delete. Um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, we could have chosen about a thousand three word race reviews that were saying something negative about the race. Couldn't we, Tommy? It was... Uh, not the not the most positive sentiment uh, after we we finished the race. No, I, I had to scroll down a fair way to just find ones that weren't. That was boring. I fell asleep. Delete this track. So I put in a couple of slightly, you know, quality was better and Max simply lovely. Just say so there was something a bit different. But ninety five percent, of course, were about how dreadful the track and race was. Indeed, um, it was. Yeah, not not the best. Uh, we never expect it, though, do we? Our expectations aren't high when we go to Abu Dhabi, and yet uh, and yet we're still disappointed uh, when we come to the end of it. But uh, I'm sure we'll dive into that right now. In fact, actually, I say I'm sure at some point, definitely right now, because my three word race review is how much longer. Now that's referring not to how much longer was the race until it finishes, or the fact that it felt long because it was, but it's more about how much longer until they change something about this track. There are possibilities, and this in particular, this season where not a lot of fans, well, I don't think any fans were allowed, were they, for, for this particular race weekend, or at least ones that I didn't see in the big grandstands. Um, they had an opportunity to mix it up. Uh, you know, Bahrain Short was, was a great example of that, just changing it up. I know there was a double header there and the fact that they had their original and then they went for short, but there's never been any positivity around this track just purely because it's so broken up you know the last sector is very much single file so many 90 degree corners the first sector again meh there's no op overtaking opportunities then you have obviously the long straight and then the the second long straight where maybe there are some passes but a lot of the time it's just a simple drs move and then whoever's just been passed gets the drs back and then overtakes again so for me it doesn't instill much drama or excitement really no. it's just it's just a, a very it looks amazing don't get me wrong you know under the lights looks awesome but it hasn't provided any great racing action at all I don't think we have had drama a few years when the championship's been on the line but the only reason that that's been good is because there's you can't overtake around this track so yeah. so for me just uh it, something needs to change exactly in in 2010 Fernando Alonso couldn't even attempt an overtake when literally the world championship was on the line that says everything you need to know about how difficult it is we stuck um, behind vitaly petrov wasn't he he was um for about 40 laps um and then even even in the the era where we have drs uh another example i can think of is hamilton essentially could just drive around at three miles an hour um to try and block rosberg back into the pack in 2016 still can't overtake so it's just a dreadful circuit we'll go into the reasons why and stuff but it's funny your three-word race review we're gonna 
move on eventually from the, the track but my three road race review is going to be uh sochi under lights because that seems to be like what it is it's just so bad so oh, so, so you're bad. You're, no, oh, that's well, not that's not my period. That would have if been if I did on a track. Oh, okay. Run. I see how yeah. it is, Tommy. End of the season, and now you're having yeah. two three word race reviews. It's the 60k Twitter followers. I'm sorry. Let, you've, it's literally <laughs> gone to your head. It's unbelievable, Katie. If you start dropping three three word race reviews, I'm gonna have to put in some ground yeah. rules here. Do it, Katie. But uh, what was your what was your thoughts on the track, Katie? And well, not the thoughts on the track. It's not a new one, but your, your thoughts on generally changing everything. I mean, it's frustrating because we've had such a stunning year of some of the best racing action we've seen in F1 in a long, long time. And so there's all this hype about these tracks and then we end in Abu Dhabi and it's just like, it's just stupid to to race there and have it as the finale. But there are obviously lots of reasons why, which we'll delve into later. (laughs) Ching, ching, dollar, dollar bills. (laughs) But yeah, it's, uh, it's always a disappointing race. Like Tommy said, if people like Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton struggle to overtake on it, then you know something is seriously flawed. But there's not much us fans can do about it, which is frustrating. We can complain. Uh, we love to complain. Boy, um, do we love. And, hey, I know a lot of people are probably like, oh, guys, come on. You, know, you have boring F1 races now and again. But we're looking at this as a, an individual problem here. We're not looking at the season as a whole. We're looking at Abu Dhabi and the Asmarina circuit and things that need to change. Uh, at Super Butters 91 says, what can be done to improve Yasmarina? Can a few corners be changed or is the whole concept of the circuit flawed? Um, I think most of it is flawed, to be honest. I don't think a huge amount can be done in terms of, oh, let's just you know, close this bit and, and change. I know there are a few different layouts you can go for, maybe get rid of um, a chicane or two. But overall, I think the whole circuit, especially the last sector, there's not much they can do as they built the whole thing around promoting the hotel, which I think we saw about 473,000 shots of it uh, over the course of uh, of the race weekend. And that should have been my, uh, my prediction, actually. That would have been a safe point. But yeah, I... I don't think there's a huge amount they can do, to be honest, but it won't stop us from complaining about the fact that they should do something, right? Yeah, Herman Herman Tilke had all that space, literally in a desert, to, to you know to build a track. Um, from from experience, we've mentioned it. I'm sure we had this conversation about Sochi. That the worst thing, pretty much, about Sochi and a lot of tracks. If you go back to the '90s, there was a lot of American street tracks that were dreadful and the reason for that was 90 degree turns and Abu Dhabi Herman Tilke's genius decided that it would be a good idea to make Abu Dhabi and there's 21 turns at Abu Dhabi and for all sense and purposes 14 of them are 90 degree turns and we know how bad that is for cars to follow we saw it immediately as soon as by the first lap they're all 1.5 seconds apart I, I guess they just well, can't follow what I want to pose to that, Tommy, is is it the cars, though? Do we no. get to 2022 and all of a sudden Abu Dhabi as Marina Circuit is the biggest banger of a circuit we've ever seen? No, because we've seen great races on other tracks. Don't get me wrong. I'm just posing the question. I'm yeah, not saying yeah. I believe it. <laughs> no, um, the thing is, yes, you'll have a banging F2 race because F2 is always good. Uh, I say banging, good for Yas Marina. Circuit, an overtake. But, yeah, an overtake <laughs> or two, but... It's that, it's that final sector, and like you say, it's hard to improve it because they've essentially built it around that hotel. So the whole final sector, which for me is the, the big problem, is 90 degree turns, essentially just twisting all around this hotel, and that for me is the sector where everything just goes wrong and it's, it's ruined You mentioned earlier as well, Matt, that the consecutive DRS zones just cancel each other out, which is just stupid. And also the pace pace difference um, needed to do an overtake is large. It's like around one and a half seconds. And the way the circuit, it just spaces everybody out. It makes overtaking, like you say, a really difficult thing. With the race this weekend, Bottas finished nearly 16 seconds behind Verstappen and Lando was then a minute slower than Verstappen, who was in first and Lando was in fifth. And that's not right. I mean, if you look at some of the circuits we've been at this year, it's a couple of seconds maybe from first to second, not 16. And that's meant to be in a Red Bull, which Red Bull have had hardly any success here 
in since really the hybrid era, have they? You know, I think they said the last uh, either last victory, or last pole position, I think it was, was Mark Webber. Um, all back in 2013, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, Vettel won it in 2013 as well, so that'll be their last yeah. their last win there before that. And so for Verstappen to sort of rock up, I mean, he had an amazing weekend. Like it's it's refreshing to see somebody else at the front of the the, the pack, but for him to win on a track that isn't really suited for Red Bull by 16 seconds to a Mercedes. I think just says all that we need to say about how what, completely flawed this circuit is. What what are what are you? So I just want to poke that one a little bit more, Casey. With with what are you saying that that, that that's wrong with the track that's allowed the Red Bull to be 16 seconds clear? Just so I just so I understand, because uh, I just see that as the Red Bulls being better on race pace and maybe Bottas plugging Hamilton a little bit. But what do you mean about the actual concept itself? I think just the nature of the track doesn't allow for the field to get bunched up at all we've seen at other circuits this year we've had really close racing and there has been you know possibilities for overtaking um, especially in the mid pack but most of the overtaking that we saw was people lapping poor Charles Leclerc after Ferrari completely messed him up with their strategy um, but I just don't think that we should be seeing such a sparse top five finish I mean when Verstappen crossed the line it felt like a lifetime waiting for Bottas and then Hamilton to pop round the corner and then even longer for Norris and Albon to show themselves as well. So, yeah, I, I just think... think I that... think the fact that Albon was catching Hamilton at the end by, what, about a second a lap and then as soon as he got behind him, he just... Yeah, it's he, it just it's, it's stagnated straight away, didn't it? So, yeah, yeah I, I, dreadful. I disagree slightly on the 16-second the gap because we've seen many many uh, tracks this year where Mercedes have absolutely destroyed the opposition. I mean, Bahrain short, they would have lapped everybody had it not been for safety cars. So I don't think necessarily there's, there's anything wrong with the actual track in terms of the, the spread, because we see that around the likes of Spa, perhaps, and, and stuff like that. But in terms of the, the, the gaps between the cars and before it's just completely eradicated, they can't get within a second to get the DRS around this track because of uh, the dirty air and, and how the 90 degree corners completely just fragment the racing. So yeah, I completely agree with that side. Um, at G890123 says, why haven't they changed the track layout? Everyone knows it sucks. It's sucked for years and it's never rained. So no chance of that even spicing up. I think we've kind of mentioned that that's because of the hotel and it's built around pretty much promoting that, <laughs> if anything. Um, and my goodness me, that hotel is ridiculous. Uh, I can tell you that for free. I mean, I've never stayed in it, but uh, we've done some filming in there in the past and I did not want to leave. I can tell you that one for free. Um, at the LA Matthews, what can we do to make this GP more interesting? It's the end of season curtain closer. It should be more exciting than it actually is. Should it be moved to a different date and another race as the decider? Uh, I, mean, I think we've already kind of noted that the fact that there's there's more to it than just, oh, we'll have Abu Dhabi as the finale, I think. You know, they pay a huge amount of money in order to be the finale. Uh, and Formula One, unfortunately, runs on dollar-dollar uh, dollar bills going into the bank account. So Yasmina Circuit clearly paid a huge amount of money to be there. I think it needs yeah. to change somehow. I, 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 it's, it's so difficult to, to really pinpoint what we can do if it's dictated by money, mainly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we've we've already said that there's not a huge amount they can do with the track layout, but try it. Do something with the track layout. Still have the last sector. Let's let's change up uh, the first sector or I don't know. Like For we don't need that chicane before the hairpin at the very least. Make that a sweeping corner into the hairpin so that there's more chance of of there being a bit more momentum going down the straight. Yeah. That that was exactly going to be my next point. Turn. I don't really get the point of the turn five six chicane, um, because through turns one, two, three, and four, they can actually follow each other, and you sometimes see cars very close. But as soon as they get through turn five and six, they can't. You know, they separate out, and then by the time they get round that really slow hairpin, they're they're separated. But if you have them, you know, following through these turns. You might have someone dive up the inside of the hairpin and then you're a lot closer going down the main straight and you know at least there's something um even even if it doesn't sort of help with the abysmal final sector but i feel like that would at least be something they could do um but like you say it's a sh it's a shame they go there for the for the final race of the season it is what it is because of money but even when we get a title finale like we mentioned earlier 
it's only good because of the tension, not not because there's actual on track action. If you think of the title exactly, finales yeah. we've had at Interlagos, they've been so good. But the title finales we've had through you know the the 2010 title finale where Vettel won and Alonso was fifth it wasn't good because it was only good because that was a really close season and they were close in the points and it was tense and and they got stuck and Vettel was the underdog and and yeah he was leading and and his car's broken down before and you never know but it's not it's not because it's like swapping and changing like you'd get into Lagos and it's it's going to be it's it's a shame because we've been waiting for a title fight for so long. Mm-hmm. Say we get one next year or the year after, we could have it. It could you know it's been what we've been waiting for for so long, and then it could be absolutely dreadful because we have to do it here. This isn't the first time, like you said, that we've we've had these discussions saying Abu Dhabi is a dull track. You mentioned Herman Tilke, who's a circuit designer. He said in twenty seventeen that he was considering small changes on the track to make it better nothing happened um and i've also i've got on considering here, let someone else do yeah. it <laughs> yeah. yeah someone it's, else it's so do it please stop giving herman tilka like why does it always have to be herman tilka because he's not made a good circuit in i like reckon 10 years. give me a desert i could make a better track than herman tilka's abu dhabi yas marina circuit million think, percent uh, yeah let the I fans so choose. many fans good because yeah what is Herman Tilke? like what is Herman Tilke bringing to these tracks? Have a few 90 degrees. Sure, we'll pop in a two, two or three 90 degrees just to make Herman happy. But then we're going to have some l- deep braking zones. We're going to have less fragmented, ridiculous single file last sectors. Yeah. We've shown but- that we've shown that, you know, look, Portimao was a far more interesting race and they could follow each other. It was exciting and it wasn't designed by Herman Tilke. It was a completely different circuit. Let someone else have a go, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, you'd be glad to know that Tilka will be designing the Abu, uh, not Abu Dhabi, the Saudi Arabia track next year. So Yay. that's something to look forward oh, to, guys. Be 32 turns with 29 uh, 90 degree corners. Can't yeah. wait for that one. It's fantastic. Um, but with, with regards to the track, um, the construction of a normal race circuit is estimated between $250 million to $300 million. Abu Dhabi was double that at an estimated $500 million to include the marina and the funky hotel like you mentioned, Matt. Um, and Bahrain and Abu Dhabi are paying a joint $100 million to host races in that part of Asia. And Abu Dhabi are probably also paying even more money to have it as the final race of the season. I mean, in Formula E, you see that... Um, Saudi Arabia are, are the first race of the season now and they've signed a deal that lasts 10 years and Jeez. that's worth an absolute fortune and you know I'm not really a big fan of racing in Saudi Arabia at the moment I mean I've got people that have gone to the races and have said it's it's okay and it's fine and stuff but just from a personal side I'm still not keen on it um but that's just one of these things they've got so much money that they can throw at f1 and like you say f1 is a business it's a sport but more importantly for the you know people at the top it's a business and they're going to go where the money is so it is a bit of a a sad thing to end the year on because it's always so rubbish (laughs) yeah it's, it's weird it's weird that they'll spend a huge amount of money to be the finale to this that and the other but they won't spend a bit of money to actually make the track good like just make some changes and then people won't see Abu Dhabi and Yasmin mm. Circuit as a, a negative because that's what a lot of people do. Like they might, yeah. it might be the finale, but then it just leaves a sour taste in a lot of fans' mouths that we've just watched a very dull race and mainly down to the, the track characteristics. So I don't think I watch that and go, damn, I'd love to visit that track and watch a, a procession. Like it's, it's just not the case. So I don't understand the business side of it. Maybe it's the fact that it'll cost too much money to change it and they just go, look, it's fine. We're happy to be the finale. Maybe we'll get one good race every 10 years. Either way, mm. uh, clearly there's a lot of business decisions that us fans don't understand. Next, um, and- next year, all the drivers should do a, a truce where they basically drive straight instead of that chicane at turn five and six. And yeah. basically if everyone does it every single lap, the FIA can't penalise them and uh, they just do the race anyway like that. Perfect. All right, Tommy's got the, uh, the, <laughs> s- the solution right there. Uh, let's go to your three-word race review, Tommy. So continuing the very positive uh, podcast we've had so far, mine is everything went wrong. The PP, I can see that, the positive podcast. Yes. Uh, so despite Abu Dhabi obviously not being great, 
um through no fault of their own the the race didn't pan out uh the way it perhaps could have done uh, and obviously the big what two of the biggest things that were intriguing were Perez being in the race which would have been interesting to see how far he could have come through the field and then people on different strategies but in almost peak Abu Dhabi uh, Grand Prix mode the fact that a safety car managed to actually ruin all excitement of the race when normally it makes it a lot better because it just allowed everyone to pit easy one-stop race Perez was out the race because he and he was going to be the most exciting factor to see him come through the field and then it didn't really leave a lot uh, of intrigue left for the rest of the race after 10 laps. Yeah, because we had the third and the constructors battle, uh, which was one of the only things going into this. Obviously, Verstappen could have got second in the championship, but we knew that was pretty uh, unlikely unless Bottas DNF'd. And uh, yeah, I, I completely agree that Perez was obviously going to be an interesting one to see if he could actually do some overtakes. Um, and you could see his frustration as well. I actually thought he crashed when we first cut to him because it looked yeah. like he was like frustrated with himself, but it turns out it was just uh, the car turning off and saying, nah, thanks. Uh, and it's it's not a great way to finish the season, especially when, well, I thought he wasn't going to be signing next year, but apparently Dead Kravitz has gone and said that he's going to be racing for Red Bull and Albon's going to be the reserve. I, I mean, that's a bombshell and a half. I don't know how much truth it is. Uh, to it because it's Ted Kravitz <laughs> but um, we'll get onto that I'm sure but in terms of the Sergio thing yeah it was it was disappointing to see and as you say it took out the slight bit of fizz that we had that McLaren and uh, McLaren versus Racing Point and who was going to finish third yeah he, he started at the back of the grid as well like you said with uh, lots of penalties to take and um, although he didn't have a mega first lap unlike Magnussen who managed to make up three places in the first lap and did a, a good job but eventually dropped down it was uh, looking to be a fairly okay race for Sergio, but yeah, it was it was frustrating that it, I think it was just a, an engine issue or something like that, maybe mechanical, technical issue for, for him, but not how you want to finish your F1 career, or so it seems, on the back of a golf cart. <laughs> maybe. Or, or apparently not. Or, do we, or do, not. Do we yeah. see anything in what Ted has said? So, so what Ted was saying is that, and, and I, can, I can see his logic behind it and i wouldn't be surprised if this was the case that it's essentially the people at red bull want to keep alban because of uh you know tie influence uh, tie influence red bull junior as well um and it kind of goes with everything red bull believe in um and then you've got horner and helmet marco who i think are just lost patience and gone well you know if we actually ever want to win the constructors championship we're going to need a top driver like Perez and thinking it from more of a racing point of view um and Ted believes that uh, Sergio is getting the drive and Albon's gonna have a year on the sidelines as a reserve still personally can't see it I think it might even the fact that they've left it um that race might even be the perfect excuse that um you know Albon did better um and and was more where he needs to be that it might be the perfect excuse for Red Bull to be like oh look it's fine so we shall see it's probably going to get announced uh, before we release this and then that, that's always the way isn't it <laughs> yeah I, I'm gonna go the opposite way and say that maybe they will sign Perez because I think I agree with what you're saying Tommy and that there's obviously two sort of people at the top of the table who want to make the decisions you've got the people that are Red Bull that own the brand and they like that tie influence that Albon has um, and maybe they think you know give him another chance in the car but then you've got the people with the racing mind like Dr Helmut Marco and Christian Horner who are saying he's com consistently underperformed this year and if you want the Red Bull name back at the top of F1 then you actually need to do something about it and putting somebody like Perez in a seat would be the most logical option but like you say it's been a whole will they won't they story for the last few months um so for it suddenly to be decided like the day after the season's wrapped up seems quite sudden because when you listen to how Perez is talking and, and Horner's talking about who's going to be in that race seat they don't seem to have a decision really made so I'd be quite surprised if it's managed to like wrap up and you know they've managed to get Checo to sign a contract within the, the last you know 24 hours even 
But I don't think that I don't, I don't think know, they maybe know. they're going to be. I, I generally don't think Christian Horner no. knows. Like he obviously keeps getting asked, and I'm, I'm sure he knows behind the scenes a lot of the back and forth. But yeah, I, I genuinely believe that he doesn't know. Red Bull um, are notorious for doing things last minute. I remember when Danny Kvyat got signed instead of Antonio Felix da Costa. Um, it was so last minute that Antonio Felix da Costa tweeted some news coming at 8 p.m. So clearly he thought he was getting the drive. And then and then so and then tragic. Kvyat got announced on Red Bull's TV channel at eight <laughs> o'clock that he was driving. So Red Bull will leave it to the very last second and then probably um, sign Kvyat yeah. after all that. Kvyat will go to know. Red Bull. <laughs> Imagine. imagine we've covered all bases imagine. here but yeah it, obviously i just can't wait for the story to be over um it's been every done podcast to death. <laughs> uh, every single podcast but that's because something seems to change every single time that we uh that we talk about it but there's still that whole thing about sergio perez and the, the phone sponsor that you mentioned before tommy and the fact that t- sergio won't be able to bring well as far as we're aware won't be able to bring as much money as as what uh, he would for other teams but maybe Red Bull aren't looking for a huge amount of investment who knows but uh, yeah we'll move on from that because it was just a bit of a bombshell from Ted Kravitz to, to suggest that um, George underscore Tucker 4 says just how much ground could Sergio Perez have made up during the race I think he would have been on the outskirts of the points maybe ninth or 10th around where Stroll was to be honest um, do you guys agree it's, it's impossible to tell because it was so early in the race but I, I... Personally, it didn't look like Racing Point had amazing pace. I'd expect Perez to be quicker than Stroll. He was from his like qualifying pace and stuff. But um, I reckon he would have got the the top end, like you say, like bottom end of the points. I don't think he'd have been challenging for a podium or anything because oh, it would have been no. just too hard to overtake. This is Yas Marina Circuit. Exactly. Yeah, he'd made up six bases before his retirement, so he was running in 14th, which is good. But... Yeah, I'm with you there. I don't think they would have been, like you say, challenging for a podium or even top five, maybe maybe seventh or eighth or ninth or something like that. But I don't think we were going to see a repeat of what we had at the Sakir Grand Prix. No, absolutely not. Uh, E.G. Mulderidge says, why did they stop both Mercedes under the VSC instead of taking a gamble? Uh, because it just wouldn't have worked. I don't know why, in my opinion, I don't know why they were talking about Mercedes keeping Hamilton out on the mediums. Like, it's almost a free pit stop. It turned into a safety car, and we saw what happened with Charles Leclerc. It completely and utterly screwed him. So from him, maybe I missed something, and that is most likely the case, but I did not see any reason for Mercedes not to double stack there because there is no point. It, it would just screw Hamilton's race, and he probably would have finished fourth. Yeah, I guess, I guess from his point of view, he saw a chance to be kind of like Imola when he stayed out um yeah but i know i know it's not the same th- but that wasn't the safety car was it yeah it, it wasn't the safety <laughs> car but 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 what i mean is it was it, normally alban isn't on the back of them yeah and hamilton can stay out and worst case scenario he's third um you know he does a gamble it completely fails and he finishes 30 seconds behind bottas and he's still third but the fact that Albon was on on the pace more and I guess they just played it safe end of the season but it did just cement them into second and third which is obviously not what we wanted to see because it would have given a bit of intrigue but um, sadly not the case they could have used Lewis as a scapegoat which I'm sure Lewis wouldn't have enjoyed and he obviously questioned it as well (laughs) but like Verstappen would have of course been behind him on fresh tyres maybe we would have seen some interesting battles maybe Bottas would have got within 15 seconds rather than 16 um but yeah, I, I yeah I don't personally see the reason or the logic behind leaving Hamilton out in such a situation. Safety cars are such a rarity at Abu Dhabi as well that I think they probably everybody just thought right let's just use this to our full advantage. I mean with Sergio being the one that brought out the safety car, the top seven pitted for new tyres within a lap of that happening. Two laps later, everybody had pitted apart from five drivers, including both the Ferraris, Magnussen, Giovinazzi, and Ricardo. So but Charles Leclerc was, was the only a... one to stay out on the mediums, right? Everyone yeah, else was his, still on the hards. Yeah, his made no sense at all. No, just Ferrari things. That's the thing. It's like his made no sense. Yeah, no. It's, it's so weird. It's such an odd call from Ferrari to leave Charles Leclerc out. Maybe it was just Charles Leclerc thing. Maybe he said, no, I want track position. I don't know. Because if you get another safety car, then maybe he's in a better spot. Who knows? But yeah, it didn't It didn't work out. And as soon as Charles Leclerc stayed out, I was like, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, Katie, your three-word race review. Mine is Science Big Regret. 
Um, this is Ooh, referring. Oh, I feel like we're going to disagree here, but carry on. Oh, okay. A little bit of spice. Um, <laughs> mine is relating <laughs> to McLaren finishing third in the Constructors' Championship. This is their best finish since 2012 with Hamilton and Button behind the wheel. Ferrari, on the other hand, um, finished sixth in the Constructors' Championship, which is their More worst wind tunnel result. time. Worst result since 1980, <laughs> 40 years ago. It's all is... a strap, Katie. It's all a strap to mm. get more wind tunnel time. That's what all the Ferrari fans are saying. Okie dokie. <laughs> Sat the ultimate sandbag. I think that's Literally. called denial, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Carlos Sainz obviously going from McLaren, who are going to also have Mercedes power units next year, to Ferrari, which maybe... I mean, there's lots of ways you can look at this. Joining Ferrari is like an elite thing that you can do as a racing driver you know it's always mentioned as a kid when you're coming into f1 everybody dreams of racing for ferrari and only a select few get to do it so for carlos Sainz to be able to achieve that dream well done him very pleased for him but mclaren are looking feisty and i've got a thing here which maybe i shouldn't get into a rant on the podcast because I mean, there's probably another time and place for this, but I said here that I really had doubts about Zach Brown um, when he came into F1. He seemed to brown nose Fernando Alonso far too much. He also didn't take any responsibility for building a car that just didn't suit a power unit when they were partnered with Honda. You know, the car didn't, they sort of built the car and then they built, like added the power unit into it and the airflow and things like that didn't suit, which is why the car kept exploding. He also let Alonso publicly slag off Honda, which is just not cool. Um, you know, if you know anything about, especially like the Honda way of life, is they absolutely pride themselves on being the best of the best. And they really struggle. I mean, everybody's gonna struggle if people are saying your car or your power unit is crap. But for Honda, it's just like, they think it's just the worst thing in the world. You know, they want nothing more than to produce something that, fits the the spec of what they're meant to be doing and so for Alonso to be going around saying about the GP2 engine and Zach Brown you know not really sanctioning him for that at all I just didn't like and I thought that he should probably take a step back and you know pass it over to somebody else because clearly we saw what an absolute nosedive McLaren had had from 2012 up until a few years ago but it's funny you mentioned that because it was only two years was it two years ago Alonso did Indian didn't qualify uh no last year, <laughs> last, yeah, year. Uh, last year yeah and and even then do you remember all the comedy of errors and uh, you, I don't think you're alone Katie I think a lot of people were saying you know Zach Brown out at that point people mm. was with like this is I can't believe this is still happening um but yeah They've turned it around, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. He's brought in Andrew Seidel, which I think is a really good move. He's been absolutely brilliant as a, a team principal there. And obviously the partnering of Lando and Carlos is one that as fans we all like to see because they just seem so perfect as a pairing. Um, their bromance is probably the best on the grid. But yeah, that's coming to an end now. And I'm not saying that Lando and Danny Rick aren't going to be an absolute fire pairing because I am so excited to see that next year, especially with the Mercedes in the back of that car. But um, for poor Carlos Sainz, I do wonder if he's thinking, what have I done? <laughs> Interesting you say that. Um, if you'd watched Internet Best Reactions, Katie, which obviously we, uh, we discussed <laughs> before we went live on, on the podcast. Well, and Tommy hasn't people. watched it either, so we're it's fine. There's two less views, whatever, don't Best care. Best fans. Um, I said that Okay, yeah, Sainz, on the face of it, might regret it with the fact that Ferrari are definitely lagging behind. They're sixth in the constructors. But at the same time, as you, as you mentioned, it's a prestigious team. You know, to drive for Ferrari is an honour. Uh, but also, I think they'll be back. Uh, they've had a few years. That they've had it before where they've been terrible and then they fight back. Uh, they've, they've already said, although you have to take what they say with a pinch of salt sometimes, that their engine's going to be much better for next year. In 2022, I think it will be a clean slate for them to really fight back. So for me, I I don't think it's a bad thing for Sainz. I'm sure he's laughing all the way to the bank anyway with going to Ferrari. But also uh, the fact that, hey, if he joins and the Ferrari isn't right at the front of the field, so what? Like It gives him time to, to really bed into the team. If he's losing to Charles Leclerc, it won't matter as much if he's finishing ninth to Charles Leclerc's seventh. Like It's never the limelight that you see between Bottas and Hamilton, for example. So for me, I don't think Sainz is 
particularly regretting it. It's Ferrari. They will bounce back at some point. They won't be sixth in the constructors every single year until Carlos leaves. I, I, I mean, I say that now, and they're definitely going to finish last next year. But that, that's that's how I see it. Is that you know, Sainz has time to to get used to a new team, which I think will be daunting for him, to be honest. You know, McLaren, of course, is another big team, but Ferrari is always that one that that has that extra little bit. Uh, no one can really put their finger on why, but um, maybe it was just Michael Schumacher. Anything to bring up Schumi. But yeah, I, I, for me, I don't think Sainz will be regretting it personally. Um, obviously, maybe next year in the short term, he won't be fighting right at the front for podiums, but I don't think he'll really care. I have completely changed my mind mind on this because when he first got announced, I I was of the opinion, like you, Matt, that's like, well, Ferrari will be back. They'll be fine. They're, they're still the better the better option coming into you know the future and stuff. I'm I'm not so sure now because McLaren seemed to just be a team that just seemed to be getting better and better. The the fact that Carlos was there almost as like a team leader, um, it seemed like such a good fit. He could have maybe built that team around him where mm. he he had that. Whereas Sainz is going to go into Ferrari with Charles Leclerc, who let's be honest is there and rightfully so. They're they're kind of golden boy like like max is at red bull and i i worry that science might might regret it a little bit if they don't improve they're going to have two young drivers there that don't have a whole load of experience so you wonder whether that will affect car development um but he's coming the, from himself and lando yeah yeah but i mean the fact that he's he's there and ferrari just seem to be going on a downward spiral. Oh, you mean there's and the McLaren need, there's, are going there's a need upwards. for more experience right now. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Ferrari almost mm. need someone with more experience to get them back to where they need to be. So, oh, it's a tough, it's a tough one. But there's no denying that, like McLaren, have just turned things around. I, I cannot believe from uh, so 2017 they were ninth in the championship. We put up a graphic about that. Um, all the Honda memes, like Katie was mentioning, GP2 engine, how bad things were for McLaren. They were the butt of every single joke. And now third in the Constructors' Championship is massive for them. What Do you guys remember Freddo Gate? Fredo like the Gate. chocolate bar? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that rings a bell. What was that? Um, so I just got reminded of it, and it's like the funniest and most ridiculous thing. At the end of 2017, when this was yes. back yeah, to yeah, you, yeah. back they to Katie. Freddo's. Yeah, they gave out Freddos as a Christmas present to try and boost morale <laughs> because they were because they were so bad. Um, and apparently, you know, there was loads of stories in the press about McLaren employees were pretty much ready to walk out like things were so bad mm-hmm. um now they seem like the happiest team on the grid yeah the you know the the atmosphere there looks amazing you, you can see it in the the videos they produce like their unbox things like it's such a happy environment and the fact that they've got another positive person like daniel ricardo coming into the team i think it's just going to get better for them they also sold a significant minority stake in their f1 operation team yesterday um, in yeah. an 185 million pound deal, so you know money is no shortage for them, and hopefully, the only way is up. Yes, good point. Actually, they've got a lot of money coming their way. Of course, third in the constructors as well is a, a few more million than if they'd finished behind racing points. So, who knows? The future does look bright for McLaren for sure. Um, maybe Ferrari will threaten they're going to leave unless they get given another 100 million <laughs> just for being there. Who knows? Time but, will um, yeah, I, I don't think Carlos is necessarily regretting it until he gets to Australia and he's three seconds off the pace. Let's find out. Uh, but we'll we'll revisit that uh, in 2021. Um, we've got a question from Millennial.F1. Do you think that the money that Racing Point lost by not finishing third in the constructors will affect them heading into next year? I mean, there's there's no doubt. You know, if you have less money, you can do less things. So a few million lost definitely affects some parts of the business. They'll be they'll have to rejig. Because obviously, I'm sure they would have like best case scenario, worst case scenario. This is probably a middle middle scenario of finishing fourth. So yeah, there's going to they're going to affect some uh, kind of the operations, and I have to rejig a bit of money. Uh, that just goes without saying. Yeah, definitely. Although Lawrence Stroll 
he'll um, just pop, he'll just top up the kitty. Here's La- two million. No worries. La- yeah, Lawrence Straw is probably the the Jeremy Clarkson meme of. Oh no. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> pocket change. Yeah. Um, I guess Racing Point. It would have it would have been a lot more heartbreaking had Lawrence Stroll not been in charge of the team. You know, back when they were this tiny little Silverstone outfit, um, you know, where they had so much less em- employees and they were punching above their weight, that would have affected them so much. But no doubt it will affect them. But it's certainly a lot uh, less of a blow now they've got Lawrence Stroll um, with with all the backing that he has and wanting to improve them and Aston Martin coming in and all this kind of stuff. So they it's it's not the end of the world, I'd say. I think it'll be very different to what we've seen in the past with Racing Point. Like you said, Tommy, you know, it used to be the small little team with administration being threatened literally just a couple of years ago. And now with Stroll Senior coming on board he has put 182 million into the Aston Martin name and taken a 16.7 percent in the company obviously he has ties with Racing Point as well and like you say he's so wealthy that anything they need he'll probably be like oh here you go I'll just slide five million across the table for you know some new aero for the front wing or whatever I think it's going to be strange because we've grown up seeing as uh, sorry Racing Point or Force India or however you want to look at them as this small little team and it's now going to take that big leap into becoming Aston Martin and bringing Aston Martin back to F1 since I think they did some races in 1960 so it's 80 years since we've wait is that right yeah my math no no oh my, 80 six, years are we in no, 2040 60 feels like it What's this happened? How long have we been in lockdown? We've been complaining about <laughs> Honestly, the Abu Dhabi mate, track I for a long like time. An, I feel like it's an April still. I'm really struggling with this year and, and subs. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think Aston Martin is going to be a team that will not struggle when it comes to um, money in that sense that it has That's previously exciting. done. Yeah, let's, it see is. Where they, let's see where they end up as well. We could have uh, a decent fight on our hands. Who knows? But... Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how that all plays out uh, from next year onwards. Um, let's talk about Red Bull being quicker than Mercedes uh, very quickly. Red Bull are known for being quick towards the end of the season. And, uh, well, Verstappen ran away with it. We've already spoken about this. But there's a question from not underscore James Bond. It says, do you believe the rumours Mercedes were saving engines or were Red Bull genuinely quicker? Uh, I, I don't think Mercedes really minded not winning. Just purely from the fact that what you know, if if they were saving engines, fair enough, because you can't overtake around the Asmarina circuit as we've already uh, discussed over the forty-five minutes or however long we've been going for this podcast. So, to be honest, they probably thought right, lap one's a great opportunity, maybe the safety car. But apart from that, is there any point in exploding our engines? Yeah, that's very true. Um, does make does make you wonder? The Stappen has been sort of. Maybe not Hamilton when he's 100% fit, but certainly Bottas. It makes you wonder if Red Bull sorted out qualifying where they could get into the lead, especially with how difficult cars are now to overtake, um, even on well, better... for one more year. Even on better tracks, yeah, for one more year. It does make you wonder whether, you know, they'd have more... whether we'd have seen more wins from, from Max. It's only his second win um, this season. Um, and like you say, like he ne- he never gets pole. Like it's such a rare thing. I think he's only had three poles in his whole career, and, and yeah. had about ten wins now. So it's you do wonder if Red Bull had got to the front more at the start of races, maybe you know they'd be having more points on the board. But I noticed that it has started already. That Toto Wolff and Hamilton are straight away doing the classic. Oh, we've got our work cut out in 2021. Red Bull are now faster. All this kind of stuff, and even at the start of this year, all our podcasts, weren't they, were about, like, does the calendar favour Red Bull? And then Mercedes absolutely walked it. So we <laughs> shall... We sh- I'm sure ne- this time, you know, next year, Mercedes will have won the title again by a huge margin. Red Bull winning the final race, and we're like, oh, well, 2022, maybe it's their year. Well, 22 Seems we so. definitely will be saying it for because yeah, of the new regulations. Because the new regs, but... but yeah. yeah, we'll see. It was... It was an odd one because, like you say, we're so used to seeing Mercedes absolutely spank the rest of the field. So to see them not struggling but slower 
you know, compared to that of Max Verstappen and his Red Bull. But like you say, there were lots of discussions um, from pundits over the weekend suggesting that they had sort of turned their engine down, their power unit down, um, because we saw so many reliability issues on Friday practice. Um, George Russell was uh, struggling with things and... uh, yeah, Vikenen Hamilton well, complaining yeah. things. Yeah, Vikenen just straight up just catching fire. Um, and Ricardo, I know that's not a Mercedes power unit, but I think there was some concern getting to the end of the year. You know, everything's Hamilton kind of on the last legs. Hamilton had quite problems, didn't he? Yeah. Didn't, didn't Hamilton, didn't he replace his steering wheel a couple of times in uh, I think that was a glitch more than anything, uh, yeah. from what I saw anyway. He couldn't select gear. Yeah. Maybe they were just thinking with everything being on last legs and they didn't want to risk, you know an engine blow up or something like that during the race that they just took it steady and let Max have the win but like you say there's always going to be those discussions of Mercedes going oh no Red Bull are really quick we're going to be in for a tough year next year and then come testing they'll either sandbag or they won't sandbag and then they'll just walk away with the title again yay positivity the positive (laughs) podcast you never know happy vibes yeah you never know 2021 could be Bottas's year did you see? Did you see the YouTube video they did with the predictions? Yes, oh, when I did. Butter said he'd win the title. Yeah, and then he just ripped up his predictions at the end in a shop. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I didn't see that bit, but um, no, I yeah, can't, yeah. Uh, I mean, he had Salty. to predict that. If he predicted Hamilton to win the title, yeah, oh, he'd be questioning what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Okay. Let's dive into your favourite segment, ABCDF One. Now it's time for ABCDF One. Okay, here we go then. Final time for 2020, where we anger a lot of people. Hamilton, <laughs> let's go with a B. 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 Is yeah, that B um, as in questioning B, or B as in you agree? No, agree B, B as in like we it? all agreed on a B. Surprised yeah. Give him an A star. Uh, oh, okay, ha, ha. awesome. Uh, B for Hamilton. Uh, Bottas, I want to give him a B as well. B. Oh, yeah, this is happening. easy. Guys. Okay. Uh, right here we go. Uh, Charles Leclerc, I want to give him. A B? C. I said C. Cut. He got screwed by Ferrari's strategy. That's nice. <laughs> he yeah. put it fourth in Q2 on mediums. Uh, yeah, do you know what Q2. you said last week? Qualifying doesn't count for points, Katie. That's um, what you told me last should. week. Uh, let's let's, let's <laughs> take this into you. account. Q2 doesn't okay. even count at all. Vettel so. hadn't made Q3 in how many appearances? 11? 12? I'm just taking in the whole weekend here. What did he do wrong in the race? It's just he had a like, grid penalty. Yeah, it just was nothing. Like we've given him. Like, Where did I finish? don't think it's worthy of a B. He finished thirteenth, maybe. Okay, see thirteenth. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I got blinded by the uh, fact that he qualified like eighth, and then I forgot he had a grid penalty. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Sebastian Vettel, C, C as well. Yeah, fourteenth. Yeah. Okay, uh, Verstappen, A star. A star, easy. A star. Alban, B. B. B? Oh, my God, this oh is so easy. Oh, my wow. Guys. Uh, Carlos Sainz, B. 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 Oh, oh my, my God. God. Are we all right? Are we feeling okay here? Uh, Lando Norris, A. A star. Ooh. Yeah, I've said A star. Ooh. No way could he have got any more out of McLaren, qualifying fourth, finishing fifth. Should have won the race. Mm. Yeah, should have won the race. <laughs> okay, A star. A star. A star. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo, A. Yep. A. Ocon, B. C. C, I said Ocon. C. Where do you finish? Uh, ninth. ninth. Okay. All right. Sure. Whatever. It's okay. Whatever. Don't care. <laughs> C for Ocon then. Uh, Gasly. Uh, I went B. for B. B. Okay. B. I'll allow B. Uh, Kvyat, A. No, no he, actually, no, he no, fell he, behind, didn't he? Yeah, big shame. I, I, if it was after qualifying, he'd be getting an A, but he yeah, he, he finished shredded his tyres and didn't he, he finished out the points. Got mm-hmm. okay, no, by yeah, I was, again, thinking of qualifying. C? Uh, C? Yeah, shame. Shame. C. C. Looks like, okay. shame could be his last race, not really mentioned it, but um, you did an article on it, Katie, that he, just, he essentially just <laughs> announced to the world that he's getting dropped, even though everyone kind of knew it anyway, but he just said, yeah, they're announcing Sonoda soon. Yeah, Amazing. he said like the, the atmosphere in the team is really bad, and I think it was literally one of the mic drop situations. Rock up, yeah, they're out. Done pretty well considering. See you later. Yeah, yeah, he's had such a weird career. But Very that's weird. For another time. Okay, uh, Steve Kvyat, uh, Perez. Can we really grade him? 
Um, I said a C because it's so hard to. Yeah. Let's just give him a C. Okay. Uh, Lance Stroll, C. I gave him a D. D. Yeah. Wow. God, maybe I'm, not, I'm trying to keep this positive podcast going here, but um, I, I was not. Yeah, unfortunately, not. He's not had a great end to the year, Stroll, but. He looked so that, good. He was fourth in the championship. We were like, oh my God, Lance Stroll is outperforming Perez. I saw a graphic. I think it was off. after um, maybe Portimao. Can't remember the exact race, which doesn't feel like that long ago. Stroll was fourth in the title and Perez yeah, was 11th. <laughs> That's and crazy. It's mad how much it's turned around. But um, uh, an interesting stat I read that Perez did an irrelevant Q1 lap and was still faster than Stroll did anything in qualifying, which is not... An irrelevant? Great. Yeah, well, obviously it didn't matter, did it? He, he did Q1. Oh, he wasn't right. Gonna, oh, gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. So even Perez not really bothering with qualifying, he still <laughs> did a better job than Stroll, which is not great for him. Interesting. Um, yeah, okay, Stroll D then. Yeah, and got uh, done at the end. Kimi Raikkonen. I don't... Where did he, he finish? He finished in 12th. 12th. He beat oh, both Ferrari. He Alfa Romeo. Yeah, that's, that's let's a give him a B. B. Yeah, I've got yeah. B. Beat both Ferraris. Uh, nice. Giovinazzi, C? Yeah, C. I said D. This wow. time. Uh, we, we're always so divided about Giovinazzi, aren't we? <laughs> it's because he's just, like, just so burnt. He, like, he, he finished, he, he finished 16th. Really yeah, he's not, yeah, he's not the most fl- flamboyant driver, um, to say no. the least. Uh, okay, well, we're giving C, him a C. We'll give him a C, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Kevin Magnussen, he had a very good start, lap one, around the outside at the hairpin. Beautiful yeah. stuff, but then he's in a Haas. So, <laughs> the Haas was reality dreadful. <laughs> the were Haas is the so Williams. bad. So bad, isn't it? Maybe give him uh, a B, because I liked his move. And we're sad to see him go. Yeah. yeah I am anyway. I am okay. anyway. B for by Magnussen. Yeah. Uh, Fittipaldi, he was nowhere. He was finished two laps down, didn't C, he? C, yeah. yeah. I think C. that's D, isn't it? I mean... <sighs> yeah, I it's, hard to, it's hard impressive to... performance at Bahrain, sure, but then this longer track. You thought he might improve a little bit um, yeah. because now he's had a whole weekend in the car, but yeah, I, I, I say C. But whatever you guys. Anyone going to change to D? Or are we giving him a C? I'm sticking with my C. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Tommy, I'm I'm staying C. Oh, you yeah, boring. We'll keep it positive. Uh, yeah, positive. Come on. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, George Russell, a, a, a pretty <laughs> big weekend. Williams were terrible, weren't they? Yeah, B. Yeah, B. B for Russell, you know, C for Latifi? D for, D for Latifi. Yeah, oh, wow. Well, He's spun Latifi. off in. What, one thing to mention about George Russell, um, I've never like experienced the level of hype to then the very next race. I don't think I saw one interview from him. I didn't no. even really know he was in the race. That must have been crazy, really weird, really weird, weird situation feeling for him. To, to be completely, you know, like everything on him all the time. There was so much hype. Everything was about him. And then he was back in the Williams and I just barely even noticed he yeah. was in the race. Sad. His time will come though. His, His time, time will come. come. Yeah. Uh, so Russell B, Latifi D. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Abu Dhabi Grand Prix predictions. So I went, oh, wow. Okay. Speaking of. Uh, so I said Russell races for Mercedes, but Bottas is faster. Look, Hamilton raced for Mercedes and Bottas was faster. So that's half a point. No. Half a point. No, I'm not giving you half what? a point for half Bottas point. being faster than a Williams. <laughs> half a point. No. Half a no. point. No. no. McLaren Overall. will beat Renault to fourth. Whee! Wrong. What? They finished they, third. They finished third. I mean, they, they beat... They beat Renault. <laughs> we literally Half decided last no, weekend perfect. that you did a prediction that was already true. <laughs> and yeah, you still managed so to get it wrong. That's a full point. Uh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. yeah so they no beat points, them to fourth and same. then beat someone else to third. So technically, oh, wow. God. that's two points for me. Cool. Uh, Katie, yours? So mine were actually two points. Because well, I yeah, said... I mean, your one, I mean... Like, you I'm went, still you went, you went bold for an Abu Dhabi race, to be fair. Yeah, you're did, really yeah. bold. So the really dramatic one that I really didn't think was going to come true is I said it would be a snooze fest, which... Disgraceful. Who, Free who would have had it? Three Free point, point, but I mean, yeah, it happened, so I'm taking it. And I'm angry. Nor- Norris top five finish. Way! Well done, Katie. Really happy for you. Uh, Tommy, you I got points. <laughs> uh, Bossas wins. He was second, so half the point. And <laughs> podium. Uh, he finished fourth in the constructors, so quarter of a point. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I got two points. Katie got none, and Tommy got three points. Lovely. Three quarters. Uh, <laughs> I definitely deserve at least half a point, but it's fine. Um, fans, Karen Singh underscore zero zero five. Mercedes one two with Max third. Too easy, Ooh. I know, but it's Abu Dhabi anyway. Wrong, Karan Singh. And underscore Nick Star McLaren to clinch third in despite constructors all despite the all the odds. Wow, lovely well stuff, Nick Star. Brilliant stuff. Um, yeah. There you I go. I had it was double points as well for the last one. Just saying. No, no, it never was. It was worth, it was worth a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be fair, you're still not probably catching up to me and Tommy's points over the whole season. But uh, I, good I think try. you probably are. To be honest, at least you I've tried. Been absolutely dreadful this year with my predictions. Well, I mean, to be fair, Katie in Australia, March 2021, will say there will be a race. Oh, actually, to go be fair, away. <laughs> I say that it didn't happen this year. So, <laughs> but uh, but either way. Um, any, any final thoughts, Tommy? Uh, we, <laughs> I hate it when I you do this. I just think of that tweet that you put yeah. out. Yeah. Oh, final thoughts. Um, well F- done, oh, F1. On. Well done, F1, for putting on a season despite all the odds. And we'll do a much more positive and upbeat, happy podcast about it next time, about the full season. Katie. Yes, I am in agreement with Tommy, which is what I also seem to say every week. But it has been a, a stunning season. It's been very strange in places, but it's brought us so much fun and entertainment in these uncertain times. And I'm very grateful that we all have it in our lives. Oh, so is oh, it lovely. Is everyone in their, oh. their Christmas stuff? Yeah, I'm in my yeah. Christmas jumper again. There it is. Looks amazing. Uh, shop.wtf1.com if you want one. Cool. Good cool. plug. Yeah. Um, right. Well, thank you so much uh, to everybody that's uh, watched and listened over the course of the year. As Tommy kind of hinted, we will be doing an end of season podcast. Uh, but I think it's a good opportunity to say thank you to every single one of you that watches on YouTube, listens on any of the audio platforms that we put this uh, podcast on. It's been amazing. It's crazy to to every time we meet uh, fans at events or whatever. It's it's always the podcast that gets brought up as being a, a big fan of it, which is which is crazy to think because I never think it's it does like that well or that people really love it. But then uh, lots of you come up and say that's your favourite um, part of the week and, and and that sort of stuff. So it's it's amazing to hear. Um, it's been awesome to have Katie along uh, on the podcast now as a, a resident member, and um, and obviously Tommy, you know, I'm just bored of him by now. But hey, he's yeah. uh, he's he's the founder oh, yeah. of WTF One, as I like to remind everybody, and he, you know, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he pulls a few strings here and there to be on the podcast. No, I'm only joking. It's uh, it's it's really fun to to do these podcasts, and I hope that you guys will tune in uh, once again in March 2021 for the Australian Grand Prix, where we'll be doing another season of WTF1 podcasts and uh, yeah it genuinely warms our hearts to to know so many of you want to listen to our <laughs> opinions um but here we are yeah you yeah. guys uh, tune in every single race weekend and uh, and it's been awesome absolutely we're we're also this year we became the what was it the 12th leisureliest podcast on Spotify as well so it's been an amazing year for our, our podcast whatever that means um but <laughs> hey ho uh, again thank you so much everybody for, for watching and listening please be sure to give us five stars or a thumbs up uh, for the final time in 2020 for a race weekend although we've got one more end of season podcast where I'll still probably thank everybody uh, but hey it's been awesome uh, thank you again to Tommy and Katie and we'll see you for the end of season podcast very soon bye 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 bye, bye. bye.